Okay, so good evening, everybody. Good evening. Oh, that's a great response. Good start. I have to move this microphone. I must think I'm a tall person. Um, so it's wonderful to see you all here. Thank you very much for making the effort to come out. It does help that it's a lovely, lovely evening. So you see, it doesn't always rain in Manchester. Let me no just say, comment. yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> all right. So this is a really important um, event. It's one of the, it's, it's the first that I'm aware of that the university has hosted, and so. Um, you know, we have to give credit to the School of Law for uh, the initiative. And I'm just going to ask Graham, who's one of the academics there, to um, say a little bit about the initiative. Um, before, whilst Graham's getting hold of the microphone, just to point out to you emergency exits. As far as I know, there are no um, planned um, fire tests or anything like that. So if you hear the alarm, follow me. I'm going out there. Um, there are also exits at the back so, uh, nearer to you. Okay, the other thing to say is that there, is, uh, there are a couple of guys at the back who are filming. Um, this is uh, intended to be a conversation with, with you, so we're not here to lecture, we're here to talk with you. Um, so if you don't want to be filmed, then indicate that. When you, if, you, if you want to ask if you want to ask a question or say something, but you don't want to be filmed, you have to find a way of indicating that, like that, like this. No. <laughs> okay, is that all right? So, Graham. Do you want to just say anything? Okay, do, I, do I need to use this, or is it okay if I just uh, uh, talk loud? Um, it's probably better for the filming, actually, to use it. It's working. Oh, yes. It is working. It is working. <laughs> Thank you. Um, very briefly, because I don't want to take up time, um, a, a, a couple of months ago, uh, we uh, actually did... Uh, uh, um, a head count of uh, the number of African Caribbean British born males in the law school uh, studying for law. There are about 1,200 uh, uh, undergraduate students uh, over three years, and we discovered that only 14 uh, were uh, British born black males. Uh, and that compared to 67 females, and uh, immediately we were shocked. Uh, by that, uh, and uh, we uh, uh, decided that uh, we should do something about it. The university has lots of widening participation initiatives, uh, and we naturally thought, well, they're not really working in terms of the law school, uh, that uh, there is something here that we need to address, and we don't know how to address it. Now, I'd uh, worked uh, in the past with Gus John, uh, with uh, uh, Stafford, uh, with uh, Charles Critchlow, uh, and with Patrick Johnson uh, 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 on various issues where questions of race were raised. And so I got in touch with the, these people, and uh, very uh, uh, immediate response was, well, let's have a conversation. We've all, this afternoon, we've had a seminar uh, in the university where different people uh, that are involved in uh, recruitment, widening participation, have been talking about uh, uh, how we're going to address it. But the most important is something that's to be done internally in the university, but it is to start a conversation. Really, that's, that's really... We want to learn from you. Uh, it's about... Uh, lawyers, black lawyers matter, but it's not just about lawyers. It's about access to uh, education. And I think uh, Patrick, uh, uh, is, has, uh, he can flesh out the one statistic or the two statistics that I've given to you, 14 and 67, and give them more meaning. But really, we, we need to learn. We need to think about ways in which we can address this issue differently to the way that we have and uh, actually do it better. Uh, uh, that uh, the university is part of this community, it's on your doorstep, and we want this, our university, our law school, to be <coughs> representative of its own community. So really, it's, I'm here to listen, to learn uh, uh, what you have to say uh, uh, about uh, recruitment of uh, male students from your community. Graham, before you hand over, I don't think you said what your role is at the university. If you did, I missed oh, it. Oh, uh, no, I, I think, well, uh, I'm the Director of Social Responsibility. The university, the School of Law recently went through restructuring uh, uh, and... Uh, uh, 
The intention, I think I can say the intention of the school generally, but it's certainly my intention, is to focus more on social justice. And uh, uh, I think there are different types of law. And uh, certainly the law that I'm interested in, the law that I've been working in, and uh, that's where I go back uh, many years with Stafford, it's law as liberator. It's law as remedying the wrongs that people suffer in their lives. And so most of my work in law uh, was about suing the police. Uh, that's uh, uh, how I developed my knowledge of law. Okay. okay, thank you. Yeah, that's great. So just hold on to the microphone. I'm going to ask you to pass it that way. So there are some people in the... This lady here had her hand up. I don't know if she... you... Patrick's going to fill you in. Yeah, we're going to do that in a moment. Gets, it gets worse. Yeah. So we're just going to ask um, Charles, Patrick, and all that just to say a bit about themselves, and, and then I'm going to ask you, Patrick, about the figures in a moment. So we just... Yeah. Sorry, um, good evening. My name is Charles Critchlow. Um, I'm actually a graduate from uh, the School of Law um, over roughly about 10 years ago, and I've been working with Graham. On, on a whole variety of things, um, primarily around pro police professional standards, uh, and looking at you know some of the um, you know some of the misconduct issues um, that we hear quite a lot about around stop and search and things of that nature. Uh, so obviously, when Graham mentioned to me about the um, this disproportionality in terms of representation, you know, I, I um, straight away I said that I worked with him. And, and, and help him on the proviso that it wasn't just a conversation within the university, that actually we have to involve uh, community uh, and, and really try to make him aware that there is a desire among our community uh, to engage uh, and, and that there is aspiration in our community um, around, you know, around these professions. Um, because often, often, um, it doesn't come across that that's the case. And I think, you know, the fact that we've got a really good turnout really is, um, is, a, is a testament to the fact that we are interested, very interested in, um, in these issues. So um, I really look forward to this being a conversation. Uh, it's not about the people on the panel having all, all the answers. Uh, it's about a conversation. It's about listening to, um, to, you, to, to your pers different perspectives. And it's about disagreeing, um, disagreeing with one another um, in the knowledge that actually that, that's where um, we will arrive at some kind of shared and better understanding about these issues. So thank you very much. And, uh, can I ask you to pass Patrick. it to Orna and Patrick? Oh, yeah. Can I ask if you join us up here, please? We got... Thank you. Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name's Ornette Clennon. Um, I'm a visiting research fellow at Manchester Metropolitan University. And the reason why I was invited to be part of this event is because I'm really incredibly interested in how universities um, outreach and work with communities. So um, how do universities really build capacity and, and enrich the lives of communities. I think that's really, really important, and it's it's a it's a growing it is a, a growing issue um, between both universities and how we do that. So there isn't very much for me to add because Charles has so eloquently, and Graham indeed have so eloquently um, summed it up. Just one final thing: education for me, and in terms of the research that I do, is about liberation. It is about um, equipping yourselves, ourselves, with the knowledge to resist oppression in its various forms. So that was one of the reasons why I got involved with this particular project, because law and having um, a socio-legal consciousness, which Charles introduced me to, um, is part of that liberatory process of knowing what your rights are, knowing how the law can actually affect and work work for the betterment of our lives as communities. But I'd say education in general is about that. So it's actually quite a subversive and political thing which we need to grasp and use. So I'll hand over to, to Patrick. Right. So 
Actually, I'm going to go this way and ask if you just introduce yourself. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Tough audience, wow. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Okay, that's a bit warmer. Um, my name's Tunde Okiwali. I'm a barrister at Doughty Street Chambers. I've been a barrister just under 10 years. Um, worked on a number of high-profile cases. Um, one that may be known to you all is the case of Dwayne George, um, which was a murder conviction that was overturned in 2014. Um, I run a charity called Urban Lawyers that helps young people get into law that come from non-traditional backgrounds. Um, and I grew up in a council estate in Hackney. Um, and the reason why I'm here this evening is for you to ask me questions about my experience coming through the system and now having to represent individuals who haven't necessarily had the same opportunities that I've had or taken a different route. So feel free to ask me what you like. Okay, thank you. Um, and I'm Dawn Edge, so um, I'm a senior lecturer at the University of Manchester. Um, my research was really into health inequalities and particularly around mental health and, and especially around African-Caribbean mental health and um, as I'm sure many of you will know a disproportionate numbers of black people from Caribbean backgrounds who are in mental health institutions um, and the underrepresentation of African-Caribbean staff in senior positions, so very few psychiatrists, very few psychologists. Um, so some real issues around culture and how that's interpreted in a mental health context, that's the kind of that's work I do. Um, I've been asked to chair this evening and this afternoon's seminar in, with my other hat on, so I'm the university's academic lead for equality and diversity, which is a fairly new role that was created under the banner of uh, social responsibility because that's one of the university's key objectives is to become a more socially responsible um, institution. And underneath that sits all the in initiatives that people have talked about around widening participation, about how we serve a local community. Um, so it it's seems right and proper that we're here in the community to talk to people about their perceptions of the university, about their expectations of the university, about their experiences of the university, and to work with us to look for some solutions to some of the thorny issues that I think we're going to debate tonight. To my left. <coughs> Hi, greetings. My name's Stafford Scott. I, um, I don't come from Manchester University. You can probably tell from my accent. I'm a Cockney Southern, Southern softy from a place called Broadwater Farm in Tottenham. I've been a community activist for many years now. I have a real, I want to say a love and affinity with Manchester. Spent many months here um, delivering community leadership training programs under the auspices of the Bernie Grant Trust um, a few years back. So when Graham invited me here, I was really keen to come, particularly well, A, because of my love of the community of Manchester, because I know that there's some really good people here when delivering the leadership training programs. I met some really high quality, knowledgeable local community activists here. So when I heard that only 12 people was on this course, I think it's 14 people out of 1,200 was on this course. And when I heard that no one from Moss side was here, I thought I wanted to come along and see what was going on something's wrong. Um, I wasn't sure how much, we had a, a seminar today with the um, academics in Manchester Union. I wasn't sure how much I was really going to be able to contribute because I've never been to university apart from the University of Hard Knock Life. But it was good being at the meeting today because the university have great intentions. They're well-meaning, but they really need help. They can't stop navel-gazing. They can't stop asking the question, how can they change things? When we all know in this room that it's much bigger than what goes on in Manchester University. So I, um, I'm here to try and give a, a wider, different perspective and to challenge where challenge might be necessary. Hopefully also to be able to support you to engage with the university, to make this a bit more meaningful than just a conversation, but to make this the beginning of a process that hopefully you find empowering and the rest of your community find empowering so that within a couple of years' time, we're not talking about only 12 or 14 African-Caribbean students being on this course, but we're talking about 12 or 14 of your children and your relatives being on this program. Look forward to talking to you all. 
So before I, I, I hand over to Patrick, because I want him to do something very specific, um, I just wanted to get a flavour from the people who have turned out this evening. Why have you come? You know, you've given up, is it Corrie tonight? I don't even know what, what it is, EastEnders. Um, whatever else you wouldn't, we'd normally be doing, Bridge, whatever you'd normally be doing. Uh, is it Liverpool? Liverpool, oh Lord. Okay, <laughs> sorry. Um, so whatever you'd normally be doing this evening, you've, you've given that up to be here. And it's been, honestly, it's so wonderful to see you all. So just a few people feel brave enough to say what, either what you, um, why you've come, or what you would like to see as an outcome. What would mean that this encounter has been a success for you? We've got a microphone, so if you just wait until the microphone comes, please, that would be great. Thank you. My name is my name is uh, Natalie Teniola and I'm a local resident here in Moss Side and um, I've been an activist of wanting to really reduce the gap between the University of Manchester and MMU and why African Caribbean children are not accessing these universities that are just a stone to throw away. So um, I'm here really to offer any support of somebody who knows this community well and how we can work with the big institutions like the University of Manchester to get more of our children and our children's children coming to these wonderful institutions that are being, being um, taken up by people who come from Birmingham and London and not, not our own young people. So uh, to me, it's not necessarily just about boys, it's about girls as well. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? So there's a lady. Just fixing, the, just fixing the microphone. Uh, good evening, people. I've got hay fever, so forgive the sniffles. Um, Anjali Sweeney, I'm a community and youth worker. Um, I would be at my session tonight in Crumpsall, but I took it off so I could come here. Uh, obviously, it's something I'm very much interested in, in terms of um, speak about liberation, emancipation, empowering young people. Um, I'd say I was lucky enough to attend the University of Manchester, and my experience was really, really positive. Um, I'd love to be able to uh, see more of the young people that I work with, as well as young people in my family and friends, you know, children, etc., accessing the universities and accessing the courses um, and just feeling really natural to walk into that university, knowing that it's part of their community capital. And it's something that I'm very passionate about and I've worked very closely with Dr. Ornick Lennon uh, to achieve that end, so. Okay, thank you. So there's a hand there and then a gentleman at the front. Well, good evening, everybody, and my name's Sahara Dixon. Um, I've come here today as a um, qualified solicitor from Manchester. I didn't qualify here at Manchester University, but still I'm one of the black lawyers from Manchester. I've also come here as a mother to two young black boys, and as much as I have been given the opportunity and been pushed the right way from, by my mother, so that I can go to university, so that I gained a, a, a law degree, so that I qualified as a solicitor. Knowledge is power, so I've come here to be able to get that knowledge, to learn and understand, so that when my boys are growing up, because not a day goes by when I'm not thinking about their future and where they're going to be, what education, the path that they're going to take, so that's the reason why I'm here for myself and for them because they, they are the future. Thank you. Thank you. Gentlemen, the friend. Good evening, everyone. My name is Richard Arlene and I'm a trainee solicitor. I should shortly qualify um, within the next month or so. And the reason why I'm here today is not only to lend any assistance that I can to any young persons who might be interested in joining the profession, but also to suggest to some other persons who are here, like myself, you can change directions later on in life. It's not all about young people. They need role models. They need, they need people who will stand up, who will be there, who will be prepared to step over and give them the hand that they need. And they need people like us, people who have done different things in life, who've had different careers, and who are prepared to get into the profession, who have the experience and the drive and a background to say, look, things aren't right. We need to step up and we need to change 
what's going on within the institutions. And it's not just the young people who need to do it, it's people who are more mature like myself. <laughs> That's why I'm here. Thank you. Greetings, uh, Raymond Bell. <clears throat> the reason why I'm here today is because I want to go and see who's coming into the mix. I call it a mix, because we've had a real serious, difficult path on this journey through life. I recognize over the years when we met you back in, in Bernie Grant, proper leadership program, but it hasn't been an evaluation. No evaluation, gun crime reduced, no evaluation. So when we're going to look what we did right, because we must have done something right. Some people in this community must have done something right because the state of affairs back in the day was just ridiculous. So we've come through uh, times. And now we've got a great opportunity to go and link. It has to be, a, for me, who's got a story of X amount of years, it has to be a proper link. It has to be, this time around, it has to be a real link because we've got too much experience. What I offer is experience. What I expect to get is experience. And when we bring that together, we must have solutions for our community. Thank you. Thank you. That's great. That's a great start, isn't it? So I'm going to... Um, is there somebody else at the back? I think there's that gentleman. Yeah. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Um, me and my colleague, Sophie, we've travelled from Huddersfield today. And the reason I'm here is because we've been looking at approaches to engaging young people and empowering them in education and also other things. And one of the things that we've set up at the moment is that where we've set up some steering groups with three further education institutes in Huddersfield of African Caribbean young people. And we've been working with them to put on a show in conjunction with the Huddersfield University, and it's gonna be called Back to Our Roots in July, so we'll be having an empowerment conference as part of that, and we're just here to get some ideas, see how other people are approaching their work, so yeah. Thank you. <coughs> okay, so I'm going to um, ask Patrick to speak now, so Patrick's going to introduce yourself, and then if you, Patrick then is going to present some of the facts and figures <laughs> around some of the issues that Graham mentioned earlier on. Okay, good evening everyone. My name is Patrick Johnson. I'm Head of Equality and Diversity at the University. And I suppose um, in terms of my own background, I spent many years working as a careers advisor in schools and colleges, and specifically um, at the University, working with a lot of these graduates, employers, recruiters, looking at positive action, looking at how we can uh, diversify their workforce. And it seemed to me that they spent um, a lot of time talking about wanting to diversify their workforce and maybe 20 years on I still haven't seen that change and there's still a lot more work that needs to be done and I think as an institution we're looking at how we're contributing um, to that and I think this event is part of that story so in terms of um, some of the statistics you hopefully should have some of that information in front of you it's not a great story um, I should say, and it, it's not a story just about the University of Manchester, I think it's about, you look at most of the universities across the country and it's a similar story, particularly within the School of Law, but not only um, law. If I look at the last year at the university and look at different subjects, if I look at physics, if I look at chemistry, if I look at politics, sociology, we've had no black males um, enter the university in any of those um, subjects. So in terms of the School of Law, um, we actually have um, a reasonable number of uh, black women who come and study law at the university, and that's the same across the country. But in terms of black males, as been mentioned, about a fifth um, of the students are black uh, males. And that sort of mirrors that national trend. There's also something that was mentioned um, earlier as well about mature students. What we tend to find within the black community, that it tends to be more mature students, and that's generally, I think, across the piece, not just with law. It's more mature students who go back into um, higher education um, and get their further qualifications, and then go into the professions um, from there. And I think law is part of that story as well, where we're seeing um, the majority complete. If you look at um, white students, maybe about 14% across the country um, are mature students who are studying law. If we look at um, black students, then we're looking more at about 46%. So that gives you an idea in terms of um, what, what I'm saying. Someone also mentioned about where people are coming from. Um, we tend to find at the university that um, 
we don't get many students who are coming from um, places like Moss Side coming to study law, and particularly uh, the black males coming to study law um, at the university. We tend to find that the majority of people are coming from um, London, um, the South East, and also um, from the Midlands um, as well. So I think that backs up um, something that you were saying um, earlier. So I think this is part of um, what we're trying to do, is sort of trying to understand um, why that is and how we can encourage and engage more with the community to see if we can try and redress um, some of that. Thank you, thank you. So here's the start of our conversation. So really this evening is about, we've shared some of the figures there are some more, so if you want to delve a bit deeper, I'm sure we can find you the information. But also, what we're really here to do is to find out what you think. So we've got some ideas and we've got some thoughts about why, why this state of affairs is as it is. But we would really like to know what you think. Um, we've already had an offer, at least one offer of help, to say, you know, I'd like to do something to help, to, make, to find solutions. That's the other thing. So it was what, what do you think the problems are and what if anything can be done to remedy them. And the third thing is, what can you as an individual or as a community do to help? Does that sound reasonable set of questions? Mm -hmm. Okay, over to you then. Just put your hand up so we can get you the microphone, please. And you can, of course, ask us questions. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah, thank you. I'm just excited, this is just great. And I just hope, as Raymond was saying, that it's an ongoing thing. Uh, one question to Patrick I want to thunder. Patrick, in this Mossai that we live in, in a two mile radius, there are 13 primary schools and seven secondary schools. Okay? One um, sixth form, which is uh, Loretto, and two amazing universities. What links do you have? That's the question. Also, hopefully, we're going to have 210 year seven young people coming to the UK Fast in Hume on the 26th of May from Manchester Academy. I would like you there, if that's available, for you to begin to talk to Year 7s about their prospects. And, you know, will the university sponsor schools? You know, will you b become their head academy? It'd be great that the University of Manchester are running Wilbraham Primary School, you know what I mean? Rather than Tesco or NatWest Bank. So I suppose that, that is a, a question for you. And for Tunde, I'm really just pleased that uh, you've come to Manchester. Just how do you, do you still have friends from your area? And how do you, pr how do you bridge that gap from being a professional as you are as a barrister and also staying, whether it's arm's length or fully attached into the community that you were born in? Who wants to go first? I can... I can start. In, in terms of um, work within the local community, in terms of um, the schools, the primary schools and, and also the high schools, we do have um, quite extensive work that we do and links with um, all the local um, schools. Uh, we have a specific dedicated, who's here tonight, a de dedicated um, BME um, coordinator. Uh, Don't I, use that word in more side, please. <laughs> Uh, a dedicated officer um, who, who works with um, those schools and I don't know whether Sam may want to say something and he can actually tell you exactly what's going on. Yeah, hi, uh, my name's Sam, I work in the Wait, wait one second, Sam. <laughs> you have to move faster than that, Graham. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, my name's Sam, I work in the university and I have done for about 10 years and I'm also part of the Ahmed Iqbalullah Race Relations Resource Centre, so I do see a few familiar faces here. Uh, and I do apologise, some of you might have been pulled in two directions because we had a Pan-African lecture at Central Library, which is happening right now. Yeah. Ideally, we wouldn't have put them on the same night. Sometimes we don't always talk to each other in the university. Um, Within our outreach, we have a, a strong link with a wide range of primary schools, secondary schools, sixth form colleges, further education colleges across Greater Manchester. I can talk at great length about exactly what we do. It's probably too much. I've got a copy of our annual report uh, right here. It's fairly dry, but it does tell you exactly who we work with, uh, the sorts of metrics we use to 
um, prioritise the work that we work with. So of those schools, you've obviously, um, as well as schools like Webster Primary, right on the doorstep here, we've also, in that mile, couple of mile radius, we've got Manchester High School for Girls. Um, not particularly a target for us, but obviously a lot of the schools that are on our doorstep are a target. Whether we're always doing the right thing, that's kind of why we're here today, to find out what we can do. We are always trying to do the right thing, and I think, as uh, I can't remember who said it at the beginning, we are very well-intentioned. Whether that always comes out the right way, we're not sure. But in terms of opening young people's eyes up to university in primary school with education, whether it's to do with, um, I mean, particularly my area is a lot around kind of uh, supporting young ethnic minority, and I know you don't like that phrase, but unfortunately that is how so much of, whether you like it or not, that is part of the lingo. Um, No, I, I, I totally understand what you're saying. I, I don't use that term as a term that I love. However, if you, you're using any document, you're in the system, and I have to say that I'm, I'm part of that system. But I'm also here today to try and find out how we can support. Um, I know we're, we've, we've met at a number of events before. Uh, you mentioned Wilbraham Primary School. It was quite a few years ago, but I work with uh, Kath Barber, who's since retired in... I think we might have even met there when you were doing some work around flags. Um, so, you know, we've been working in those schools for a long time, whether it's always recognised or whether it's always aware. We don't always know within the university what else is being done within the university. So part of that problem is perhaps ours to ensure that we know what is going on and we can communicate that fairly to all the people that we are uh, responsible to as, as a university. Okay. Um, in terms of the question you asked me, um, the community is the reason why I'm here in the first place. Um, when I was growing up, most of my friends were criminals, so they were either dead now or in prison. And when I first started, that's where I got my work. So people would call me up um, and say, such and such has a case. And that was the reason why, at such an early stage in my career, I was able to do such serious cases and progress as quickly as I have been able to do. So for me, um, it would be a crime if I didn't actually offer a service back to the community. And that's why I set up my charity to help people get back into the profession. So um, on my social media platforms, I'm, I'm readily accessible because I'm a byproduct you know, of an environment that wasn't necessarily the best, but has helped me to get to where I am now. So I can't necessarily be benefiting off the success of people and then saying, well, I've made it now and, and leave you alone. It doesn't really work in that sense. So to that extent, um, my charity set up a branch in Manchester. So they operate out of BPP Law School up north. So it's just more a case of, you know, be giving my service back. And that's really just been my ethos, to be honest. Anthony? Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Anthony. Um, boy, where do I start? For me, and with the university, I know you're talking here from the School of Law, but it's, I find it difficult to separate it from the whole of the university. And if you're coming here and asking us, what can you do for us as a community? Yeah? The university has been here through everything that's been happening within this community. Yeah? And where School of Law is concerned, this community has been well known for issues to do with the law, criminality, and things like that. Yeah? So, and the university, when these things have happened, have always found their researchers to come in yeah, and find out information and do their studies around what's happening, and then run away and go back and write their books or write their papers. Right? So they know. If they, if they really wanted to know, they would get researchers to come into the community and talk to the people and do the study in, in every area, not just in law, but law comes into every area anyway. So it doesn't necessarily seem genuine sometimes, yeah, because when the university do plans, they don't do plans for a year, two years, they do five year plans, 10 year plans, yeah, and understanding and knowing the history of this community, which isn't very difficult to find out for over the past 10 years, just tap my side in the internet, and you will see it was well known. Even the council here have done whatever they can to change the name that was branded by this town. Yeah, because you put Manchester in, you get Gunchester. Yeah, and there's been a massive clean up, gentrification, we can see it. The precinct that got closed down, it was a community hub. 
It was ahead of its time. It didn't need to be closed down and knocked down. It needed to just be cleaned up and changed. So I would like to see some long-term, long-term agreements made based on the facts of this community. I'm not an academic. I can't break these down into statistics and everything, but I've seen these universities do it. And I've seen researchers come into the community and get books off the back of this community. So I don't need to tell you what to do. I'm just saying do the right thing, yeah? And show us the facts. We, we know within ourselves, but you can put it in paper on paper. You know how to use that language to get it noticed. You know how to get things done to change policy and understanding. Go back to Stafford, what Stafford was saying, and, and, and Ray before, in the sense of this community. A few years ago, there was a kind of acknowledgement about the situation within this community. They had something what they called Agenda 2010, yeah? And that acknowledged so much of the disparities within this community and why children were going to jail and why they were failing in schools and why we were not getting the health services that we required. It sounded amazing. And loads of people stepped up to do their part to make it work. And all of a sudden, it was dropped. Yeah? I renamed it Agenda 20 when? <laughs> because it didn't happen. So we want you to put it on paper. Write it the way you write it. So, so the greater nation understands it. We can't do it like, like, like write it like that if we ain't got, got what you've got. You're trained in that way. You're thinking that way. You're talking that way. So transfer what we're saying into your language and put it where it's supposed to be and let it do what it's supposed to do because you know we've been suffering for years on years and years and people are still here, still in hope. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Uh, my name's Anthony Brown. Um, I just wanted to uh, make an observation about two things. Um, Anthony uh, mentioned about being genuine. Now, you want to work with the community, but what I've heard a lot is the youth, the youth, the youth. The youth have parents, they have uncles, they have aunts. You said in your statistics that a lot of the people going into law are mature people. Now, if you have mature people from the community going into law, then they will know more about the law than it just being about crime. Law is about every aspect of our lives. And we're not hearing that broadness in your engagement. We're not hearing the um, broadness in terms of who you're trying to reach out to. Why haven't you got the Open University? here as well, if you're going to say that you're engaging with the community to show that it's for all the individuals within the community and they then can say to the young, young people, because they're, the young people are in their homes. So day in, day out, they'll be able to say to the young person, you know, have you thought about law? This is what law is about. It's not just about crime. You can go into employment law. You can go into law about trust. You can go into property law, all sorts of areas of law. Uh, and, 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 and enlighten the young people about the broad spectrum of the law and also enlighten the community that it's all of them um, from, you know, teenagers right up to mature people like me. Thank you. <laughs> so, so thank you. That's a really, really important point. And I, I think um, in response to that, I, um, as Patrick outlined the figures, that we already know that in terms of black students going into law, it's, it's, whereas for white students it's about 14% are mature, for black students it's about half. So I guess if the language has been couched around youth, it's because there seems to be much less of an issue around older people. The major problem seems to be that we're not getting any young people in. For my own, for my own self, not, not to do with law, because as we've all been saying, this is a much wider issue than just law. Um, and one of the challenges I face as an academic who came into academia later on in life is that it makes it very difficult to actually have a longevity to make the kind of impact 
that um, Anthony's talking about. So when you start your career in your 40s, your academic career in your 40s, you don't have long to make an impact. When you have academics who are coming out at 18, you know, as like that, some of my students now who are coming in at 18 to do their first degree, they stay on, they do their masters, they stay on, they do their PhD, they start their academic career in their mid-20s, they have a long time to make a big difference. And because so many of us, we're kind of squished towards the end where you've got 10 to 15 years before you're looking at retirement, it's very difficult for us to make the big inroads in the institutions that, like, that I personally would like to see. So that's, for me, that's a personal thing about wanting to get more younger people. It's not, it's not to stop the older people doing it, the more mature students. It's just saying we need a, another means of attracting younger people in. And, not just, and part of that, I think you've touched on, is not just to see law, a law degree is about um, becoming a barrister or becoming a solicitor. So I'm in the School of Psychological Sciences, and less than 20% of my students will become psychologists. Most of them come to university to do a psychology degree, but they will go into journalism or human resources or PR management, a whole range of different things. They have no intention of being, of being psychologists. What they want is a good degree that has the ability to carry it with, with transferable skills that can carry you. Law is one of those, and I think there's something about... I think the lady at the back who talked about knowledge is power, about how we, we market the degrees, the degree programs that we have at university. Patrick said, it's not just law. There are some courses, there's nobody. There's nobody doing physics. There's nobody doing chemistry. That's ridiculous. Okay. I welcome um, some of those inputs was made there. Now I'm going to talk to the staff from the university because I'm a bit of a campaigner. I also do community engagement. And I've got to say to the university, there's great that you've come here and you've said, we want to listen to the community. And every time the community talks, you go into defensive mode. So the community says, we don't like the word BME. And someone says, well, that's how we use the language. But the community says, we don't like the word BME, and there's a reason behind that. The reason behind that is because our experience gets masked in the experience of BMEs. It's what's been happening in Manchester Uni. It's why all of a sudden you've all, you know, when, I mean, I'm being a bit short here, but it's why all of a sudden you've all just realised that there's only 14 black people from the UK they fear. Our experience gets masked in it. Mm. The creation and this knowledge of BME was created mm. post the uprisings that we had in Marseille and in Tottenham in the 80s. It was created as a means of stopping us from making the demands that we were, were making. And the impact of that is why we're here today, that there isn't enough black people, whether they be mature or young. And you know, again, when the community says, we can't just talk about young, that's not that we disrespect our young, we love our young. But to only consider our young means that you're sacrificing everybody that's here today. And people that are here have real opportunities um, have real skills and have something that they want to give. And it may be that in our community, because white kids grow up in a white country with white rules and white laws, they may be ready to go to a white university at the age of 18. Others who are learning how to traverse and, and navigate for a racist, hostile system may take a heck of a lot longer to recognize that actually going to these universities may be of use and of benefit to them. So I'm just begging the university people, and what you're saying isn't wrong. I understand why you stand your ground and you try to explain what you're doing. But today, we really have to listen to the mm. community. And we do it for two reasons. One, so that we can understand better. I'm going to go three reasons. Two, so that we change our language and our terminology. Mm. And three, so that they believe that what we want to do today is different from what a panel tried to do four years ago, and a panel probably tried to do 10 years ago, and a panel tried to do 12 years ago. In developing relationships and partnerships with the community, their resource is their thoughts, their views, and their perspectives, and their experience. And we've got to value that, and we've got to make sure we value that. And I think, oh, look, look at the nature of the people that are here today. We've got to listen. So, is it Sam? We've got to go back to unis. And we've got to say, in some communities, this term, BME, is meaningless. In Tottenham, we say BME, B-M-E. Bloody means everything. But we're not here for everybody. Our experience is totally unique. And this is a real great opportunity to share and benefit from that. So
My name's Juliet Maynard, and um, for me, I think it's a couple of observations. For one, the radius. I am from Burnage, which is an area near Stockport, but I've travelled all the way down here today because I've got a brother in the system. Loads of his friends have been in the system. And I went to a school which was in Didsbury, so your, I, don't, I don't think your um, initiative would have actually come to my school. But those, kids, those boys are in the system, so that's one observation. Um, two, I've worked in high-level policy, and coming back to what this gentleman said before... I think what we're discussing today is pipeline. But in terms of pipeline, there needs to be sustainability because once you've got them in the pipeline, what do you do with them once they're there? So I think it's about long term because when, you, when, when the government are doing their policy stuff, they are, they're forecasting for 20, 30, 40 years. The succession planning, they're looking at how they get this embedded, what, what it will look like if they had it in place. So I think there's something around um, sustainability and succession planning as well. Um, and... Part of that, once we've got them in the pipeline, is helping individuals to navigate the system, the, the profession once they're in it, because I work in a highly political environment, and I can honestly say it's taken me years, it's taken me years to get the style, and to, because I just went in there thought I could tell people about themselves. Literally thought I could tell people about themselves, and they literally thought we'd get you out the door. You know, so they, they do things more of a Machiavellian way. So there's all of that to take into consideration. And what I would like to say is, I was listening to uh, Peace FM, and that's how I found out about this. Oh, sorry, sorry, <laughs> legacy. Um, and that's how I found out about this. But I do think that there's a, there's, in the area I live in now, there's actually um, a lot of individuals that were originally from down here because with gentrification comes people being moved and displaced. So I think it's about looking at the parameters of your, your, your initiative to begin with, starting the discussion from there and then capitalizing. And, and also you might want to set up an advisory group because that's generally how it's done. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So there's a lady there and then... It's got a gentleman on the left. Um, it's just really to address the lady academic. I'm sorry, I don't know your name because I came late, so apologies, everybody. Um, I've been sat here and I've been, I've been you know, listening to what you, what you actually said, and I feel that, you know, I could be wrong, that you are actually still measuring us by a white yardstick especially when you're talking about our young people, you know, typical, I mean, we're in a white system, yes, but what we, we don't have, the white system isn't set up for us. It isn't, it doesn't embrace us, and we have to struggle through. I mean, I was probably one of the fortunate ones who went to university, but I didn't go at 18, simply because my mother couldn't afford to, to send me. So she, what she expected me to do was to go out and get a job. And I did that for a couple of years, and you know, I, I, I paid my way to university. I eventually got there. But even whilst I was at university, and even when I was mature, I still felt that my maturity, which I felt would have served me well and helped me to navigate, I was still having to wake up every day and be quite strategic in how I'm gonna get through this, because I knew that nobody wanted me there. So can you imagine what it's going to be like for an 18-year-old? So I think what we have to do, we have to make a seismic move away from um, a white stereotype. We're not, we're not, we're not white. We're, just, we're a black community. Mm -hmm. Until the universities realize that they have to deal with us in a different way, and not expect us to come up through the same route like everybody else because we don't have the same opportunities. If it was a level playing field, yes, we would, we would get there, but we won't. So I think that part of the academic structure is to start to think about how, how you, we, you're going to look at the black community and how you're going to cater for the black community. And if it means that we're, co we're, we're going when we're in our 30s and it, and it seems to be rather trunc truncated part of our lives, then so be it. That's what you have to deal with. So that's just my thought. And then this gentleman over here has been waiting. Let's not, just do that because you're there now. Thank you. Um, Hartley Hanley. 192 years this university has been here. I've observed this university divide and rule this community. I've watched this university 
identify black people that it feels it can control and contain, I've watched it work with them, I've watched it ignore the others, and I've watched it set black people against black people, and I've watched it do that again and again. This university knows we're here. This university is one of the largest employers in the city. One of the things, if it wants to start developing <coughs> confidence, mm, is give us job. jobs. <laughs> Let I know there are lots of black people in this community that's made it as solicitors in spite of this university. Whether it's the John Poisers of this world who grew up in this community, whether it's the Wilma Deans of this world, they've made it in spite of this university. This university had black people working there as cleaners, as porters. Recently, this university decided to form a partnership in this community to set up the works. It got with the city council, it joined with um, um, Manchester uh, Metropolitan, it joined with a number of white organizations. It made no attempt whatsoever to work with black people, yet it was creating the works supposedly for black people. When I wrote to um, the vice chancellor, Mrs. Watswell, about the divisive nature of their work, she ignored what I had to say because she felt that was being aggressive. This university clearly knows what it's doing. The amount of people this university employs outside Manchester, from Preston, Bolton, all over, and on its doorstep, it has been systematically ignoring black people, ignoring jobs that it could offer. Local people I know in this community who've got skills cannot get work from this university. If it starts giving us real jobs, not, not porters jobs, not security jobs, because a lot of our people now, our young people and our elderly people are skilled, are qualified, <coughs> but it is not interested. And when you go to university, when you finish, you have to then decommission your mind in order to actually cope with that system. Because when you get in there, it actually is about controlling you so that you no longer want to relate to that very black community that it says it cares about. We need to think carefully, strategically, about what we're doing with this university. My name is Horace Jones. Um, I want to say a round of applause for that gentleman there, because um, what he had to say, I, I thought, basically hit the point. Um, one of my main things is uh, my wife's in primary schools and she teaches kids how to read. Now, you've got kids that are in year, year two and three that can't read in these areas around here. So we're kind of already fighting against the wall. So by the time these kids go to get to secondary school, they're, they're still way behind. Now. I've always said like these places like like the Yakamo Road, um, all these kind of these places that we have as as like black groups. I think community centres. I think these that should be doing more for the community, and also I think us as individuals, we need to do more for ourselves. I think I think we stop. We, we need to stop looking at outside people to be doing stuff for us. You know, if if if, if you've got kids. I think you should be telling your kids that yes, you can be a lawyer, you can be a solicitor, you can, you can be whatever you want. We should stop looking at other people to say, well, yeah, um, they've got to come in and help us. They've got to come in and do this. So I think us as a nation, we've got to start standing up for ourselves and start doing more as individuals before we start pointing fingers at other people. McKay. I think the one point I'd like to make, I've only just come in because I was at uh, another lecture, is that the university has a habit of sending people that we recognise to appeal to us. Has anybody got any ideas of, in the university of the trauma that we go through when we actually go to that university? 
They're not interested in what you're interested in. They're always looking for how they can get a master's degree or a PhD on the backs of our pain. Why would we pay so much money to put our young people through that system which doesn't cater for us or is interested in what we're doing as people in our own community? I went to Juicy High School, which was next door. Next door, and I'll tell you this, not once did I ever see that university contribute to the workings in my school? What do you want from us now? We are not handing over our young people to you anymore. You destroy them and then spit them out. That's what you do. We can look after our own and we'll, we'll provide the education because we have got many people in our community that can provide the education that we need. It's just an expensive game that you all play with our young people. And that's what I'm here to say today. Hi, um, I'm Akisa Jilks. I'm studying at college and I'm studying law. And I've came here today to more find out what is there for me to and what the help is there for me to get through this. Because I won't go to uni and I want to do what study law, but I don't feel there's much support and there's not much groups to tell me and information on, on what is coming in the future and how to, different hurdles that I might come across in the future and how I can get pat by that by still getting my goal and what I want to achieve. And for me, like, I went to Wright Robinson High School, what was in Garton, and there's a high, really high population of young black boys in my school at the time. And when you go to the teachers to say what you want to do in the future and what college, they, they always push you to sports. They push you to, oh, why don't you try sports? Why don't you do BTEC sports? They don't really push you to the law. Like when I asked my teacher, she said, don't study law, law's not, you don't really learn anything about law at college. Until I went to the, well, well I went to my interview and said, yes, yeah, study law, it's a good, it's a good um, start for you to do for uni. But they push you away from that, and you don't really know until you get information from other people in the community that tells you, no, it's, it's the right decision. So for me, I feel like there should be more groups and more information for young people to get into. Because if it's not there, then we're not really going to look at it. We're just going to bypass and then do the football, do the basketball, do the netball. But you don't really push us into the education-wise. We get pushed into sport because that's what we're good at. So... <laughs> Did you have something to say? I just wanted to make an observation um, for the university. Someone talked about we go in and do research and then we kind of don't leave anything behind. So as a university, we need to perhaps think about not doing research, but building capacity, doing yeah. things with the community. Yeah. So the question is from our point, um, I've got my university hat on, what is it you want us to do in terms of to help build capacity for you? Because obviously we don't know or our ears are blocked. So you need to tell us what it is you actually want us, want our expertise for so that we can help you with it because we have the expertise and in partnership with yourself, we can perhaps do something that is not necessarily research, but practical. We need to let them think we're not begging anymore. We're not begging them for anything. Treat us as human beings. Don't divide and rule us. Don't come and say, I'm going to get on with Stafford because he's a nice colored gentleman, but that Hartley Hanley is like a, let's not talk to him. Stop that rubbish. Because in the white community, it's no different, but you still get on with them. We need to stop that nonsense the university is doing, and it knows what it's doing. It's our money they're spending. It's your parents' money. They may be interested in the young people now because the young people can go out there and riot. They're not interested in the older ones because they think they're too old to riot. <laughs> but let's think about it. It's our money. It's our resources. Everything they're using is ours. The university don't have money. It's ours. It is, they're not doing you a favor. Stop going there begging. And we do need to stop begging. We need to stop begging. Demand it. It's your right. 
because we've been here long enough and enough of us have died in Southern Cemetery. It's our money. Enough of us young men have died in their wars. It's our money. And we have a right to what's there, not a favor. Can you just do that one minute. Okay. First people uh, who haven't spoken before, I'll yeah. give the mic to you. There are some people that have spoken, but, but I, I've seen you. Thank you. My name's Brian. I work at the University of Manchester. Um, I also am working for the Children's Hospital, and I'm studying law. Yeah, thank you. I'm studying law. And um, one of the things that I try to do with the Unison representatives at um, the Manchester University is find out how come there aren't any black people on the panel and always have a knockback. So rather than shouting at anyone or being assumed to be aggressive and pushy, what I'd like to ask at the end of this is if I could liaise with all of the panel to see if we can then approach the um, Unison representatives to say that we need people from the black community to be there for us because everyone I've, I've got, I pay a membership and it's just white people on the panel. And I've tried to get myself into the panel and got a knockback. So I'd just like to ask at the end of this meeting this evening if we could uh, liaise with each other to do so. Thank you. I'm the lady at the back. Hartley's probably said what I was going to say, to be honest. Um, Dr. O, I mean, Dr. Arnett, I hear you. Um, and I love you, you know that, but when you ask us, tell us what you want, I find it so patronising. I really do. It really it does my head in. Anyway, tell us what you want. Aren't you guys supposed to be the degree-holding university people? I'm not saying that, you know, you know what, I've had this conversation with you, but at the end of the day, don't assume that because you guys are in the university and we're not that we don't know as much as you or more, because I actually think we know more. Just because we don't speak in the manner that you do, it doesn't mean that we can't. Just because we don't have letters after our name, it doesn't mean that we don't know more than you guys do. And if you're asking us, what do we want, then you shouldn't even be in there. Because if that question has to be asked, I'm, 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 pretty, I'm pretty appalled. Do you know what I mean? And it frustrates the hell out of me. Also, if, if there's research to be done, which is usually, usually done about us, We'll do it ourselves, commission us, because you commission other people from elsewhere all the time. It's embarrassing to be sitting here having this conversation in 2016. We've grown up in the shadows of those universities our whole life. We've watched your plan, yeah, to move to Hume. I'm talking about MMU now, because how many people in our community? We've grown up watching these two universities, and how many even know that there are two universities? Because a lot of our children just think there's one. Right? All you university people know that there are two, and you are rivals, and you always have been. But actually, people on the ground don't give a hoot whether there are two of you or not, because we just see you as one and the same. Even though, personally, I'm... F anyway, better not say <laughs> <laughs> But anyway, forget it. Good evening, panel. Um, I'd just like to ask, um, you posed, uh, a question was posed, what do, you re what do you want? What I'd like to ask the panel and these people at the front is what power have you actually got in order to orchestrate change within the university? Can I, uh, can I ask, uh, answer that? Because uh, I'm, I'm running round with the mic and uh, I hear uh, uh, what you're saying. And, uh, and uh, uh, I'm from the law school. Just wait a minute. Sorry, I, I'm, fr I'm from the law school. Uh, the people on the bench, actually, Tunde obviously is not from the university. Stafford's not from the university. And I think... Uh, sort of observing what's going on, I'm the person that maybe you should be shouting at because I'm actually here representing the law school. And, uh, and uh, well, first of all, I, I don't want to be defensive because I don't think I've got any reason to be defensive because uh, I 
uh, years ago as a member of the Moss Side community, was very much a part of this community. And uh, it was when I first met Gus John, was a part of the Moss Side defence campaign in uh, 1981. So, uh, but I think there it's about what is the university for and what is the profile of the university. And I think uh, Manchester University, not uh, talking now about Manchester Met University, but to the university, its international profile is all important to it. It's not the community in which it is based that is important, it's its international reputation that it is important. And what this initiative is about, really, there are two parts of it. First part of it, black lawyers matter. Now, in order to become a lawyer, at the moment, it is necessary to qualify, and the easiest route to qualifying as a lawyer is through a university degree. That's going to change in a couple of years' time, and uh, uh, there's talk about online examinations and uh, uh, changing access to the legal profession. But the first thing that's uh, important is making the connection between over-representation of black people in the criminal justice system and under-representation of black people in the legal profession. Tundi, I think, has already made a comment about that. And that is, uh, is a battle that has to be fought. So that's the, that's the first point that, uh, uh, about black lawyers matter. The second point is about access to education. And, uh, and I think, really, uh, language is important in the way in which uh, 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 we express ourselves. But I am quite clear in my own mind that uh, despite all the initiatives that the university has uh, funded, they are not working. They are, they are, I know that we know that, but the thing is, at the seminar this afternoon, I think one of the things that Stafford said is that the university needs a new perspective. It's got to widen its perspective. And it's got to widen its perspective. I take that to mean widen its perspective culturally, not internationally, so that it attracts Chinese students that pay twice as much as British students. So that's, but that's a battle that those in the university have to fight as well. That's our struggle, if you like, because we all struggle where we are. In our workplace, uh, 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 the unison rep there, Ad Adele here is uh, from USU. But the thing is, we all fight in the community in which we exist. We can't fight other people's battles for them. But within the university, there are people that are wanting to actually change that culture of the university. So it is more relevant. I'm proud of Moss Side community. I'm, a pr I'm proud of its uh, achievements. I ran away from Moss Side in 1983. I'm sorry, 1984. Uh, uh, but uh, always proud of it. So I think that's really what we're saying. We're not saying uh, we want you to tell us what to do. There are people fighting in the university to change it. Uh, uh, what we want you is to tell us as it is. And I think you're doing a very good job as well. But I, th I think I'd just like to say, it's not, it's not these guys' fault. The people that you should, I sh you should be uh, venting your anger in, the, in terms of law school at me. Mm. Sorry. So I was gonna say, so people are asking about what, what power we have and I guess, from my own perspective, so to go back to the lady who was, you know, who was talking about the, the mature student and, um, and, and the different route that we go through. So my role, as I see it, is about influence. That's the power that we have. That's the power I have as an individual, as one um, black person in the university, you know, who was um, a couple of my black students who have said to me recently, well, more than recently, you know, you're the first black female academic I've ever met. So my role in the university is to be there, is to be visible, 
is to do the kind of research that answers some of the questions that this lady over here was mentioning about the kind of things that we need to know and, and understand, the kind of questions that have not traditionally been asked, and no, because nobody's really interested in the answers about what makes us really sick and what we're going to do about it, and acknowledging that the system doesn't work. And so going back to the point I started to make earlier, and probably not very clearly, the reason I was talking about the importance of the pipeline, as they call it in university speak, which is to get younger people in, and we're not saying we don't want the mature students, let me be clear about that, but to get younger people in and to actually have them going through the whole system. So one of the things that happens now, not just in law, but across the board, is young black, whatever, whatever age they are, black students, there's a huge attainment gap that's the, that's the people coming out of university with a 2-1 or above, like a 2-1 or a first, which is called a good degree, that there's a big gap between white students and Asian students and black students who are much more likely to come out with a 2-2 or a third. And that means it's very difficult for them to go on and do other things, like having an academic career. Okay, so part of my, part of my offer, I guess, part of the, the influence I have is about working with young people in the community, helping them with their personal statements so that they can actually get into university. And that's not just young people, I help older people too. Helping people with their assignments, working alongside people who are about to be thrown off their courses to help them to, um, to advocate for them with their, with their institutions about the challenges that they face and about why it is that they should be given another chance. Um, so, so I think, going back to the young man over here that said, you know, each of us has got to do what we can, where we can, and I think somebody else picked that up as well. So, at the moment, what we have is influence. I've taken on the role of the university's academic uh, lead for equality and diversity, precisely because I want to make a difference. So, in my role, I have influence, for what it was worth, in, in all, the, uh, all the areas. As academic lead, it's about the, the curricula, it's about the staff, so looking at the, the over-representation of black staff in the lower grades, about the lack of progression of academic staff like myself, about the over-representation of people like me in disciplinary hearings and so on. So that's part of my offer, and it's to use, I think the lady over here said it very eloquently, use the resources that we have, do the research that we have about why these things are happening, and use that to challenge the system to change. But in order to make that sustainable, we need more of us. So when I leave the university in a few years, if there is not 10 more like me, then I think I've failed. I think we've failed as a community. We have to have more of us in there doing that work, otherwise I will leave and it, it, that work will stop. And that's one of the problems that we have. It's not sustainable because there are so few of us. Oh, that's the only one. There are lots of us. Diane's the only one. The, the one one in each department means it's very difficult to make the big changes that we want. So that's part of the plea really is about Coming. We, we want to do this in partnership. We're here to co-produce solutions. I think that's, um, that's really positive, Dawn, and um, was well appreciated by people. But I think that the most chilling thing that I've heard here, I think Anthony was pretty chilling, but I think the most chilling thing I heard here was this sister, I think her name's Lorna, who said that the youths do not realise that there are two universities in this town. It, undermines a lot of what you just said. Because if they don't understand that, it says, A, the messages are not being sent to them that this is for you. B, they're not hearing the messages. And C, that they're limiting or limiting or because they're not getting those messages, they think that their opportunities and their choices are limited. And then that just adds to this sense of powerless that many young people often talk about and often feel. So it's good, and you use the key word, I think, about partnership. And I know when Doctor said there, what do you want us to research? He wasn't trying to be patronizing. He was actually trying not to be what doctors in universities are. But there must be some way that <coughs> communities and well-intentioned, well-meaning universities to come together to create partnerships that then enable the universities to carry out the research into the lives or the issues that the community throws up. That the, you, that the university and the community can then use. Real meaningful, real life research that just doesn't go and sit on the shelf, or like Anthony says, it's research about people from a distance that they don't recognize and the author kind of <coughs> not necessarily gets rich off, but moves away from, the, um, from community 
with. I actually think, um, I'm sitting there and I'm wondering, I, I hear people talk about shame. I think communities will vent when they see um, representatives from public authorities, local authorities, public bodies that they haven't seen often enough and that they haven't developed relationships with enough. Too often, public sector bodies, when they hear communities vent a little bit, they run away and they don't come back. Right? Communities are not crazy. They're not going to come here every week to say the same thing and to keep on venting. I think that what's being taken here is a really good first step, and I applaud you, Graham, a good first step in developing relationships that can then create meaningful partnerships that can then answer what you were asking and then address some of the needs that um, have been muted here today. Thank you. We've got a microphone at the back. Yeah, Mark. Yeah, Mark. Um, a few things. I've heard a lot of good things said this evening. One of the things that concerns me, though, is that for a long time I've known, I'm only young, but for a long, yeah. time, for a long time I've known that um, we have uh, an, a kind of us and them situation. We have a people who are great at divide and conquer. And so we have to be mindful that we don't now go up against our brothers and sisters who are trying to do something to help because we have a different idea of how it should be done, okay? But certainly as regards um, the way that the system works, if the system is broken, um, to get into the system to try and fix it is almost a waste of time. They don't have our best interests at heart to begin with. Uh, for instance, is you're talking about law, but the university will teach you about the legal system not the lawful system. And so we often go up against a legal system that is set up against us rather than the lawful one that looks after every man equally. Okay, so I, I'm quite well versed in the law and I know a little about the legal system. But the university is not there to teach us how to avoid the system which is designed to keep us where we are and to keep a certain people where they are. And so Whilst we're trying to make sense of all of that, if we're not careful, we end up battling with each other because somebody wants to see us get somewhere and so they want us to come through the system. But the system is broken. It's, it's set against us. So it doesn't make sense then to go into the system. It makes sense to have your own system, a bit like the brother over there was talking about, us relying on somebody to give us jobs. We all have skills. We all have a purpose in life. And... If we're relying on someone to give us a job, we're always going to be begging and capping hand. But if we offer our skill and do something, then the skill we have it will always be needed. And so we have to change our mentality. As regards the universities and there being two, I didn't even know it was two. And I, <laughs> um, I just saw them all as a one. Wow. But the, the, wow. no, really. And, and so what I'm saying is, in the end, if we're not careful, um, we're, we're trying to have some kind of discourse about how we can better ourselves. But you can't better yourself in a system that is corrupted and broken. You have to create a new one. It's a bit like, because of the times we're in now, we get MPs knocking our door only at this time of the year. And we moan about it, but guess what? We go back to the same system and we try to moan about why it's not working. It's not designed to work for us. It's not designed. But I can't put down my sister or my brother for trying to get into the system and help somebody through the system. What I've got to do is educate myself and anybody who's willing to listen, let them know that there's a better way, a more excellent way, and that is to educate yourself based on you and your people and your history. We actually are the reason why they have a thing called university. And we've not remembered that. So we, we go to them as though they have something that we need. We've got it, but we're so divided and so... Uh, distracted, and remember, part of that distraction is created by the very people who are going to to get the help, because of course they create the problem and then create what they see as the solution. I think I've said enough. I think I'm just going to make a point, panel. Um, 54 years of age, lived in this place all my life. <clears throat> I'll stand up, sorry. Yeah. I think I was one of them middle, middle conduits when gun crime was about the place. I went, into the, I went into the mix, and I went received really well in the mix. That was a police institution. And I remember when 
the chief constable came in here when a lot of black boys was being killed and he come and talked to an hostile audience. It was something like this. And he was in a position of authority. But it was only little old me at that time who could go and see that somebody was trying to do something in the community. You have to see it has to be a personal thing. So we're not saying, because you have to go and say it's not all the police. Because they talk about the police, they talk about the university. Not all the university, that was time ago. Our children now have got an opportunity because people have raised up to your ranks. I'm going to take a breath. Because people have raised up to your ranks and they're in position right here, right now. If we use our collective spirit and our collective minds together, look back at what we've done, our good parts and our bad parts, and realize our errors, our children have got a chance. Let me share this with you. This is what I want to share. My dad passed last year. And in passing, I realized, you know what? The elders are going, Raymond, you better realize this, you're an elder next. <laughs> so if you haven't got a knowledge from the elders, you're going to miss it. So what's your most important thing? Gather the elders. That's my duty, my duty right now. Gun crime, black people, black kids killing themselves. We had to do something. Not many people stood up, because I understand they weren't nice. So I understand. But I got seven boys, and I didn't want them to go and feel hurt that I seen individuals was feeling. I didn't want them to feel that. Stafford in London, the same thing. In Liverpool, in Birmingham, the same thing. Black people didn't rise up. I said, you know what? We're not going to talk to the police. We're going to make this thing go on and on and on and on. And this will till our generation really, really collapse. Well, here it is. Gather the elders, first and foremost. Gather them in the space from all nations. Create a council of elders from Nigeria, from Jamaica, from St. Kitts, from Trinidad to Ghana. Organize ourselves in this community. Link out to our great resources. God, there's some fantastic resources. And if the university can help us to go make those links, and make those business links, because Africa's rich, everybody knows that. The Caribbean's rich, everybody knows that, but we're not linking out. But our graduates, our children, and now got those skills. So why are you gonna depend on somebody, really? When we can go and use, utilize our children in the same environment, City of Champions, Manchester, and make them become all that they're supposed to become. I got beef with all the people in the mix because of the way I am. Me personally, I've seen certain things, so I'm going to talk truthfully. I've seen people who wear their arts on their sleeve. I've seen them, and they exist. I wouldn't mind calling them all up in the mix, give them a, an award, and say, you were brilliant in my life. You were brilliant to make this community now stop from gun crime. Because when people was coming through that door, everybody was running for cover. And they realized how nonsense it was. We've come through it now. We've got an opportunity to link with the university to go on, I, the, bro, the proper question, what do you want? That's what I would ask. That's what, I, what do you want? I want research, and we've done something back in the day, I want research to go and cover all that data, to go and see what we was doing well, and see what we was doing bad. I want that research. You know what I'm saying? We can go and utilize our children. The police officer, Ian Hopkins, came up to me, chief constable, he said, Raymond, we need some police officers, in black police officers in. I said, no problem. Raymond, how can you tell him no problem? Who are you to go and tell this officer no problem? Because I've got a plan. As far as I'm concerned, my brain's working. If I go and collect 72 nations in the place and I tell one of the nations, bring me your best individual from your community, he's going to have to go and choose from 72. And there's a whole collective will go in at the same time and they'll realize that, yo, we got these officers who's going to now police and they're going to become role models and the youngsters are going to see them doing great things and they're going to see that these people are living legally. We don't have to go and utilize our minds and communicate. I'm too passionate, so sometimes again, <laughs> I'm too passionate because I'm in certain places at this moment in time and I can't communicate with this passion, so I have to tone it down. So I have to go and get somebody else to go and speak on my behalf, but they have to understand what I'm talking about. No use somebody speaking and don't understand what the next person's talking about. No use having a solicitor and he can't understand what the person's talking about. So you get the right person to go and do the talking. Skill now. You know what I'm saying? I can see the eyes open. You know what I'm saying? Because the struggle I'm going through, or I was going through, and it's personal. Say, it's not about you. It's true. But my wife, the other day, she just got honoured. She's got honoured on the journey. She never wanted to be honoured. They decided to go and honour her. 
because she understands the work what was taking place. So more times still, I've realized doors are open. When they say you're going to come and talk to the community, who's the community? Who's the person who's going to stand up and talk on behalf of the community? Community is too many individuals. Somalian communities just come in the other day. So you can't say, like you said, black and ethnic minority. No, you keep the ethnics and the minority, and we'll defend the black. It's not rocket science, and we'll work together. That's not rocket science, neither. And we're going to get from utilized things from countries where we come from, come from tones that we know, and we'll communicate. Not rocket science as far as I'm concerned. But my time is running now. <laughs> Just like the first generation born in England, our time is running out, and we're not even going to be remembered. It's true. Let me show you. Let me show you, because you see, Natalie says it's not true. You know what I'm saying? Well, <laughs> the elders over in the Caribbean, they're there and they're dying off. Who had real cultural knowledge, who are culturally aware, and we're not connected. And we've got all of those nations in this place called Manchester, speaking all different languages, and we're not connected. And if we would have had all of these people connected in this diverse place, we would have been able to go and solve half of their issues in their community, because we've been able to communicate and reason. We'll be able to reason about all sorts of things, because people get too emotional, me I do. But once you go and capture this thing and you start to see it with a conscious mind, you get the academics and the skilled people and you put them in the place, you get the business people, put them in the place. You know what I'm saying? If I was in this society now, last point, if I was in this society right now, you know what I would tra train my children to do? I'll train my child to become a footballer. 300 grand a week, imagine. But imagine Raymond. though. Just, just yeah. pass the microphone to Natalie. Imagine. Thank you. Thank you. Raymond, I just want, we are the elders. Our children are having children now. We're in our 50s. And you know what I love about this community and, and Moss Side is that we, come on, we've known each other, most of us known each other 30, 40 years. It's a, it's a community that's stable. It's a community that, that's friendly, that each of us, you said we're not connected. Of course we are, Raymond. It's about more connection. I just want to um, just give you a, a good story and a true one, okay? We've, I've been, even when I didn't live in Moss Side, at Long Side, we would come to this area. It, I just love it, and now I'm here again, living here and working here over 35 years. I had a, I've got an eldest daughter, and who's shy, who went to Wally Range High School for girls. She first went to, she went to Bishop Billsborough, actually, and um, I took her out of there. I don't know why, but it, in the last year, and took her to another school. It was the best thing that was happened. And then she got level fives in her SATs. She went to Trinity High School and decided to leave because the boys were irritating her. That was the worst thing I thought was going to happen. And she went to Wally Range High School. There was an access. Julian just reminded me. I've forgotten the name of it. Manchester Access Program. Thank God for that Manchester Access Program because my daughter Yinka went on it even though she wasn't qualified because it was a course for children who wanted to, or young people who wanted to do anything in the medical field and their parents hadn't gone to university. But somehow she ticked them boxes and she was on it. But, and you know what? There's, there's always a ploy. Whenever we want to do something in this community, all hell and heaven break loose. But there's something about staying strong. And Moss Side have that resilience. We have the aspirations. We have that family. I've I, I worked in North Manchester. i worked in Withenshaw. And I don't feel community like I do in Moss Side. So she went on this Manchester Access course. They were saying to her, well, what do you want to do? She said, I want to be a doctor. I said, right, let's go to Stratford Building. You're 11 years old. Let's go to Oxford Road on Stratford Building. Oh, no, you can't come in. It's all security. I said, please, let's just go through. There was a woman there called Mrs. Cousins. I don't even know where she is now. She was the security there. And she said, Natalie, there's not very many African-Caribbean uh, doctors here. There's Nigerians, but not very many 
African, Caribbean. So then she left Trinity, went to Wally Range, as I said to you, went on this access course. And because of that access course, even though, as somebody was saying with the careers, they were pushing her to pharmaceuticals, she said, no, I want to be a doctor, not a, um, a chemist. And um, she left a school with two A's and a B, that was not enough for her, her to do medicine. But because the University of Manchester, she says she got in by flukes, but that's not true. To do medicine, it means that she was studying day in and day out. It took a lot of work, so I keep challenging her on that. But there's something about the University of Manchester said, because you've done the Manchester Access Programme, we will let you in. She had to do one year foundation. So I'm telling you, it, there is good stories. The University of Manchester, MMU, and the local community are working together with the elders. We have so much resource so much assets in this community were overflowing. So I just want to encourage us to stay close with the university. My question really is to your daughter. Sorry, do you have to say, what's the end point for um, My question Yinka. is to your daughter. Oh, so, oh, let me just put, <laughs> Diane Watts, where are you? Stand up. Yeah, stand up, please. Um, yeah, Diane Watts, who, who does the Louise Dacacodia, said to me, Natalie, come to uh, see us with Yinka two weeks ago. And Diane bought Louise Grant, an African-Caribbean specialist consultant, big time. Now, Yinka and Diane are now mentors. So you can see how we've started from Moss Side, Bishop Billsborough. We've got through. You see how the links? And even now, we're linking together with the Louise Dacicodia Trust, and now they're mentors. The question is for me. And she's a qualified doctor. And she's in her FY1. Yes, yeah, she's getting there. She's getting there. And that's all the, the, the links, you know? That's all the links. I, I can't tell you. There's people in this room that will know that I've had an influence on my family. But my question is to you, Dawn. When's the next meeting? The marketing was poor and late. It was only you telling me and Jeremy telling me, Julian telling me, um, that this was happening three weeks ago. What happened? That's, that's when I found out. Well, you know. <laughs> well, to be fair, I think, I think. So I, just a couple of questions. Yeah. When, what's happening from here? Why was the marketing late and poor? Have you got dates scheduled so that they can be in people's diary? Because like somebody said, I was going to uh, the library. China's colonizing Ch uh, Africa. It's an important one. Mm -hmm. I've decided which one to go to today. Yeah. Not right, yeah, yeah, you know yeah, what I mean? No, you, I you're agree. both university, so where are we going from here, really? And what's next? I want some dates right. for the next so one. Let me answer the question. So Thank I'm gonna you. Give, give the microphone to Graham, please, and he can answer. What I was going to say is, in the last, like in 15 minutes, in the last about quarter to nine, I want us to think about some of those action plans. What are the next steps? So There's some really good things that we've said. Um, in terms of the marketing and the dates, Graham will talk to you about that. What I really would like us to do um, is when we've talked through some of these action plans, one of the things I think would be really powerful is if there are people in this room who want to be a part of a short task force, working group, something to actually take forward the plans to think about how we move that forward. I think that, I think that would be something that would be really worthwhile doing. And then we, we then think about what we do next. So as a group, we decide, we get all the actions from today and from the, this afternoon's seminar, we look at those action plans, working together with a task force or what would we call them, an action group, to work those up into, into workable plans that we then continue to bring back to the community so that we continue the conversation about making sure this is, this is real, this is real, it's live. And as somebody said earlier on, we've got to end up with things that are sustainable. It's no good coming in with a plan and a project and two twos, it's over, it's gone. It's got to be something that we embed, not just in the university, but within the community. And that goes back to the capacity building about how we work with people to capitalize on the community assets that we've got. We are, you know, I, I think I was, I was saying to Graham at the, the, um, the event this afternoon, one of the things I definitely didn't want, which is one of the reasons I agreed to chair tonight, is because I didn't want the kind of deficits model where the community is seen as being in deficit and we need a helping hand because we have got assets. And it's about how we mobilize those in order to help ourselves and to make a real difference. So the dates will come. 
but we'll agree those with people. And we'll make sure that next time we we'll give you more time. Is this talk? Yeah. If people, uh, I think what we need, uh, and if we come to the uh, stall uh, uh, over there, and if, uh, if you give us your names, but the thing is, really, this started off uh, uh, very simply as me seeing that figure of 14 and saying this isn't right. This cannot be allowed to continue and what can we do about it? And as I, I think I said to you, the first person I spoke to about it was Charles and uh, I worked with Charles on several things and he said this was more important to him than anything else in his work at the moment uh, uh, about access to education, not just to law but uh, uh, to uh, uh, education. And I think also in terms of uh, the marketing and the publicity, uh, I don't know if the university has ever done anything like the uh, jingle, I think that Anthony did. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, it would, everybody was blown away by it, but it's probably quite normal in the community uh, for such jingles and what have you. But it's not what, it's not what the university does. As I think, uh, as you've already said, the university tends to speak at people. And uh, again, it was Charles that organised that uh, jingle and spoke to Anthony. And I think Anthony's going to go in his... Uh, I don't know if anybody uh, is going to speak on uh, uh, his programme that's uh, 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 coming on at nine o'clock. But I understand that anybody that's uh, been involved now is uh, he's going to uh, allow... Or, or if I allow Anthony to explain, it's better. Um, yeah, I mean... It's been a great, I've, I've got to go because I've got my show that I do on Legacy 90.1. I just want to invite anybody to give us a call um, and share any views of what they thought about the meeting this evening. Um, it'll be greatly welcome. Um, I've employed my sister. Where is she? She's hiding. Well, my sister's here and anybody else who's got a phone, you can just go onto her phone. She'll phone into the studio and you can give your views. Um, Here's the number, and I'll read it out now, but hopefully somebody else can read it out again. It's 07599642626. Okay? Thank you. Question mark there. Is her name Isabel? Okay. So, Isabel, and then Slater here. Can, Graham, can we just have the microphone? And then if we make... But, but just to answer that, why it was so advertised so late was that all of it was organised quite quickly. We just felt we had to do something to start uh, a discussion. And I think, uh, I think it's very pleasing what happened at the university earlier today and uh, here, the, uh, uh, the response and uh, what we can learn from this, uh, this meeting. So it will all be fed back in uh, uh, at a later date. Who needs a mic? Yes, Bell, please. Hello everyone, um, thank you for coming down tonight. It's so good to see so many familiar faces here. Um, I wanna say two things really, and I'm speaking to you as a Hume girl, <coughs> as a single mother, um, and also as a member of staff at the School of Law, I work in recruitment and admissions now. I've been there for a few months. So I'd like to take this opportunity to offer my help and support to anyone of any age, any background, if they're interested in studying law or applying to the university, please do come and find me at the end of this event. And I'd love to talk to you about the different ways of getting into the university, the different ways to train to become a solicitor or barrister, anything like that. So please do come and speak to me. The second thing that I wanted to say is I think it's quite obvious to everyone in the room that there's a lot of anger here towards the university and I think that anger's very just. Um, I think the university has got a really big image problem and um, I think there's a lot of people in the community <coughs> who don't really even understand what the university is there. It doesn't, it's not there for them. We don't feel like it's there for us. We don't feel like it's the courses that it offers are of interest to us necessarily. We'll feel that it's an elitist institution. And so I really feel like this is a really good opportunity for us to tell the university we want you to do some different courses. You know, we're all here tonight to talk about Black Lawyers Matter. We don't have enough black people working as solicitors and barristers. We don't have enough black probation officers and so on. I feel like if the university was to offer some courses around things like Black Lives Matter, 
black social justice issues. This is what our young people care about. This is what our communities care about. And I think it's a really, really important point to stress that the university needs to change the curriculum to reflect and interest and engage the, the community. We don't really, we've done enough research. You know, we know what the issues are. We know what the barriers are. We, we know all about that. What, what the university doesn't know is what we're interested in. You know, and what we're interested in is justice for our communities. And if they can provide courses that will speak to that, I really feel like young people will apply. And it's not that people don't have qualifications or they don't have the ability, they do. They're just not applying because they're not interested, unfortunately, because they don't feel that this university and these courses are for them. So I feel like that's one of the main things that we need to do is look at racial justice, the legality of that, make courses about that, make these courses relevant to these communities, to our communities. And I think we will see a change then. Thank you. Okay, thank you. John. Yes. Um, I just wanted to respond um, with some of my thoughts um, about what's being said. Do we have to stand up? Mm. Got me back. Wait. So <laughs> I've written some points down. Um, so for me as a community and youth worker, um, my first experience at university was um, at the University of um, Central Lancashire in Preston. And it was pretty much awful. I didn't get my honours uh, because of uh, institutional racism at the university, and I'll, I'll openly say that. Uh, I tried to pursue it down the legal um, channels, so forth, so forth, and it, it never happened. My second experience was at the University of Manchester, hence why I say it was positive, and I feel lucky. But listening to what people have said and reflecting on it, I'm like, hmm. It was better than my experience at Preston, but I wasn't lucky to go there because essentially it was my right. I think that's the first thing I wanted to say. Um, as a youth worker, for me, obviously, youth representation and understanding of youth subculture is at the heart of emancipatory learning for young people. You can't just give them, hmm, this is what you must learn because we say, it's going back to what you were saying, uh, Isabel, it's about the, the, the courses in the areas that reflect and are relevant to young people today. Um, for me, I think, Dawn, you spoke about a task force and action plans, which is great, um, but I would like to maybe speak to the chancellors and the directors of the university and hold them to task about what their agendas are and actually say, what actions are you going to put in place uh, going forward? And I think it was Graeme who was speaking about the universities need to widen their perspectives. At the end of the day, a mindset is an individual mindset. And I think... As a black person, when you walk into, particularly MMU, in my ex first experience, implicit association will always win out over what's fair. I think it's not equality we're looking for, it's equity. So it's not a case of we're coming to you because we want something. There, there, there's a fair balance of power. Um, Foucault said it, um, postmodernist, he said power is everywhere. It's excised, it's not given or received, it's ours through discourse and regime truths, it's ours, so we can take back that power. We are the experts. So it's about creating the partnerships that you talk about. It's, it's about commissioning people within this community, because again, Popol talks about 80 different types of community. So the university's understanding of community will be different to our understanding, which will be different to his. And you know, so it's about understanding and, and, and coming from a baseline level. So we both, as entities, know what we're talking about in terms of community. Um, and going back to, I think it's the policies and the legislation that allow us to self-determine our futures. That's what I've put down here. I think uh, Hartley was rightly saying that the university is 192 years old, less than 50 years ago. Some of the archaic laws, legislation and policies that were in place were suppressing you know, and oppressing people of color in this country. So for me, that type of 
arc, you know, ancient institution that still abide by, you know, those, those laws and legislations, obviously it's not going to be positive for us. So that's where the change needs to happen on an institutional level. And we talk about strategic and embedding stuff and underpinning stuff, but the whole system essentially needs to be picked apart, deconstructed and rebuilt and remodeled to reflect what we're asking for and what we, what we want essentially. And I know it's going to be, it's complicated, it's ugly and it's going to be messy, but it's completely necessary, completely. And lastly, um, I think somebody was applauding Graham for taking the first step and, you know, applause to you, Graham. But I would also like to applaud the audience for coming here today because clearly this community has a lot to say and there's many, many experts. And, and that's it, really. Thank you. Thank you. And finally, so, first of all, Graeme, I'd like to call you out because I've been trying to catch your attention for an hour and you've not given me the microphone. I suspect that's because, <coughs> given the, the level that I've worked at, I know how to do this work properly and not as a tick box exercise. So, first, one of the things is I would like to ask why you've come as law and not taken a holistic approach. Because if we're saying that this issue is across the board within the institution, then it, it needs to be holistic. Um, I suspect that's to do with the politics of the agendas within the university, because I worked in one for three years. REST 2020 is what's the priority in the, in the universities at the moment. Um, our widened participation is losing money left, right and centre, and it's, you know, it, it's about capacity and it's about um, having the resource to actually do the work. But what I would like to say is, if you are going to do this work and do a, a, a real change, then the commitment and the resource needs to be secured. Because you've, got, you've, got, you've had loads of people in here tonight who have said, we, can, we know better. You need to capitalise on them. Some of them have said, you know, they'll do their own research. Why not give them the, give them the skills? There's pots of money out there. See whether this money can, whether this money can be accessed facilitate them doing the research because it's more credible when they go out into the community and they're accessing individuals that realistically you will never get into the, the, mind, the mindset or the mentality of. You will never be able to get them to open up to you in the same way. And as the person was saying before in terms of the research of the work that's being done, now, I think that's one aspect of it. And then there's another aspect. There's a lot of talking about mentoring. And... You know, coming through, I, I literally just found my way, went to uni twice, found my way, ended up in a highly political environment, and I had this good boss, and I kept saying, oh, I don't think I can do it. And she said, no, Juliet, it's all in your head. So she sent me to London, and I met with the director of the Crown Prosecution Service, who was a black woman at the time, and she broke it down for me. But the thing is, I had to go to London. We need our own networks up here, and like the gentleman was saying before, let's not get everyone to do it for us. There's many people in this room that can be mentors, I would like to see, not the law thing, because I think that that's about um, your, your ratings in the ranks, basically, if you're going to pipe past me for an hour because I suggested work. Um, I would like to see that the university supports the establishments of those kind of networks right through from when, when those kids are coming in, going into college, when they're going into uni, because I went to the University of Manchester. It was very different from my second uni, first uni, and it was brutal. I was in there with arrogant public, ed, public school educated children. But I was, in a, I was working daytime, so I just popped in and popped out. And, and I was working with individuals who, to be honest, most of them had two degrees or whatever. So I wasn't intimidated because I'd already been in a professional environment. But when you go into that environment straight out of school, straight out of college, it's intimidating. It, and it can be very intimidating. So I would like to see a bigger picture and a more holistic picture about setting up a network. I tried to set up 100 black men in... Manchester. I'm a woman, so they said no. So, no, but the, the rationale, the, you know, the, the, it was right. They were saying that, you know, boys relate better to men. So look at how we can get all these things going in Manchester. We should not need to be travelling down to London to, to, to access those kind of things because that is how you make the change and that's all I want to say. Okay, that's great. Can I, um, I'll just address the point about the holistic, the holistic view. So, as I mentioned before, so I've got this newly, relatively newly created role about the ac academic lead for equality and diversity. So part of my role is really doing the fact finding, is finding out what the university is already doing, what it's done in the past, what's happening in the community, what other universities are doing and doing better than we are, um, so that we can, that we can learn from that. So, starting with law is actually using it as a bit of a case study to see whether we could do this, to see whether people would come out and talk to us, 
to see whether we could have a seminar today and what people would say, what kind of things would come out of that, and whether we could then move it forward. If we can then do that, then we have the, you know how these things work, we can then take that to the senior leadership team at the university, to the president and everybody else, and say, right, we've done this in law, this is, what, this is what's coming out, these are the resources that we need to be able to do it, and we want to roll this out across the piece. You kind of have to be strategic in your direction. Yeah, so it's on the radar. <laughs> so I'm just conscious now. We've got about five minutes. Um, and what I want us to do is to really... I'm sort of hoping that the person with the hand up is going to be talking about solutions or action points. And if we can have a few more of those and then... Yes, no pressure then. No pressure at all. Hi, uh, Jenny, Jenny Christopher. Um, I'm, re I'm realising that, uh, I mean, even within this hall here... There are a wealth of people, uh, a range of experiences, um, representing the global majority. And um, at, currently we're collecting information from um, this pad going around, connecting, co connecting contact details. Um, I think we could actually build on that by um, including within our contact details um, our areas of expertise and things that we um, could actually contribute. And that would be a starting point, because at least you start to identify all the different individuals within the community, which could actually bring something to bear. I mean, everyone here wants to participate in their own rescue. I'm sure of that. And I'm sure that regardless of what area of expertise you have, whether you're a, a mum at home, everyone has something to contribute. And I think that information needs to be gathered at the earliest opportunity. And then we can begin to look at how we can um, capitalise on those skills and then build those networks. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so I'm just going to give um, panel members an opportunity to reflect, to any last thoughts, and then we'll, um, I'll tell you what I've, the notes I've made about in terms of actions, if there's anything else we need to add, and then we can wrap up. Um, thank you very much for sharing your thoughts and opinions. I've learned a lot. I think the takeaway for me has been partnership and continuing the dialogue. So it's very important that none of us leave here today and this is the end of the conversation. Um, that's something that I've experienced in the past and I think that the way that we move forward is that action is actually taken. Um, the room is full of people that have a number of different skills, insights, knowledge come together. Um, someone mentioned a, a point about, you know, the them and us culture. And I think the way to kind of move away from that is doing collective projects. So even if they're not legal projects, you could do something very straightforward, like for example, a fundraising exercise in collaboration with the university, raising money for a specific community project. And that would be a way of you know, building the relationship up. The issue I see now is that there's no trust. And I think before anything meaningful can be done, you need to build that relationship up. So maybe do a small project that isn't directly related to the bigger one and then build that relationship up and then start working towards it. Um, thank you very much for having me and sharing your opinions. So before I, before I pass on, just let me just, just say, um, you'll have seen some beautiful objects on the table at the back. So I'm just encouraging you before you leave to go and have a look. So um, Sister Natalie here is... Um, is part of a community interest company with other members of her family, and they are selling these objects in order to raise funds to take a group of local children to Gambia. Um, so it's really worthwhile call, so please support them. On this table, there's more information about the law school specifically, um, pens and some, a few giveaway things, but also some of the people from the law school will be there at the end, so you can go and ask them any questions that you need to ask. Okay, like Tunde, I'd like to um, say thanks for allowing me to participate in this um, initiative. I think it's worked out better than I anticipated. I'm not sure what Graham's thinking at the moment, but I um, certainly wanted to start a conversation, and I think that you've certainly done that, sir. For the uni, I think I hear you all... Well, I certainly hear the community demanding partnership, and I think I hear you trying to reach out your hand to create those partnerships. But I repeat that the most chilling thing I've heard in here today, I think, 
is that young people in Moss Side don't even know, and it was reaffirmed by mature people saying that they didn't even recognize that there was two different universes on their doorstep. I think that's a damning indictment of both of those universities. And that um, at the very least, by the end of this process, everyone needs to know that there's two universes and hopefully this process will make them more accessible to everybody. But I agree with Tunde. It's about developing relationships. It's about developing trust. <coughs> And um, I think that joint working is certainly one of the ways that, that you can actually do that. And if you can raise some funds, where the uni can rightfully use its skills to help build the capacity of the community for the community dis to decide its priorities and what it needs to carry out research into to ensure that they get more legitimacy and justification when they want to go on and do bigger better, and better things, I think that that's excellent. I applaud all of you who have given up your time today, especially as Liverpool's playing. I didn't think we liked <laughs> Liverpool in Manchester, but especially as football is playing. I applaud all of you. Don't make it just be a one-off. Keep them to any commitments they make and ensure that you turn up again and again and again. Thank you. Yeah, I think from my perspective, I think this has been a great start um, to what I hope is going to be a good relationship. I think I've spent many years um, working within the university and my whole role is about equality and it's about looking at underrepresentation. It's about, I think we've only just started to get to the stage where the university is moving away <coughs> from just looking at BME, I'll use, use that term, but looking at different groups and looking at some of the issues that we're talking about today in terms of underrepresentation, under particularly of um, black members of staff as well as um, students as well in particular positions. I think uh, Dawn and myself, within the next couple of weeks, will be going and we'll be speaking to the senior leaders within the university. And one of the things that we're talking about is what can we do around increasing representation? What are we doing about representation of students but also staff within the university? I think um, the many years I've worked at the university, just coming to this event tonight, has given me um, a lot more ideas um, that, than we've had for a while in terms of some of the things that we can really do to try and affect um, some change. And I hope that this relationship will continue, will help to uh, give us more um, help, ideas, inspiration in terms of how we can work closer together and make a real change at the institution. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Isabel has just got a hand up. Do you want to give you the last word from the floor, Isabel? I just wanted to say I've had a couple of people come up to me already um, wanting to find out more about how to apply to the School of Law. So I thought it'd be worth, just in case people have got to rush off, go home to your children or whatever, my email address at the university, if you want to get in touch with me, I'm going to be here for a while, but if you can't stick about, my email address is Isabella, it's I-S-A-B-E-L-L-A, -L -L -A dot cox cox at manchester dot ac dot uk if you forget that you lose a bit of paper just phone up the university and ask to speak to isabella cox in the school of law or carol barker who's over there yeah and if you address that to me and I, I'll, I'll help you as much as i can you know whatever your background whatever qualifications you've got you can come to the university if you get the grades, and I'd really like to help everyone here who wants to, to have access to the university. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so um, it leaves for me to thank you all very much for coming out. Um, and just a, a brief summary, I think, um, as Patrick says, I'm hoping that we've all learned something from being here. I cert certainly have, and it's been... Great to be back, to be in my community and not back. I'm at a church down the road and being here. And, and I actually also want to use this opportunity to thank the members of this community who have worked with me, you know, developing um, solutions to mental health problems and, and are actively doing that now. People with mental health diagnoses, their carers, members of uh, voluntary sector groups and so on. And I just really want to say thank you very much for that because the work that we're doing, and I can see some of the people here, Anthony is one of them who's just gone, 
that work couldn't happen without you. So I'm really grateful for that. And it shows that it is possible to get partnership. You know, when I was applying to the National Institute for Health Research to get money to do research into black mental health, um, one of my colleagues said they won't give you the money. It's too much money and, and, and it's not, if nobody knows if it's going to work and you can't engage with people from the community. And there was a long re lots of list of reasons why it wouldn't happen. And one of the things that swung it for the, with the funding bodies was about the partnership with the community, which, which saw us win a national award for the work that we were doing in the community. So I want to use this platform to say thank you for all those people, and people like Anthony who champion it on the radio all the time, and um, Lillian who puts it in the, in the Nubian Times, and various people who are working together. So some of that network, I know that that network exists, and I know why Natalie is so passionate about the community. So I really want us to hold on to the energy, including the anger, because that's great for change, making change. Um, so I want us to hold on to that energy and use it to fuel us in the right direction to work together, as my friend, uh, as Raymond said at the, fr at, the big, at the front here, are working together rather than tearing each other down, because too often, if we're really, really honest, we end up doing that. And it was, it's in the collective of, of working together that we're actually going to make the changes that we need to see. So some of the things that um, I've heard, <coughs> excuse me, the, the creating the partnerships, that it seems to me that we're all committed to that. Um, there's something about challenging, particularly with spe speaking specifically around law, but I think there are some lessons for other courses as well, but specifically around law, to, th to put on courses that people will actually be able to engage in, things that they can see how they're relevant to their lives, so think about that. There's acknowledging the power, that there's a power differential, and that we all, we all have power as individuals, we have power as a community, but actually systems are set up in, in such a way that sometimes the power gradient is very powerful and it's sometimes difficult for us to navigate our way against that, feels like we're swimming upstream. So we need to do, think about that in terms of the resources, excuse me, <coughs> hay fever, some of the, some of the resources that we, um, we ask for from the university. So if we're going to be doing this kind of work and the university is committed, we can't do it on the cheap. It needs to be something that's done with proper commitment and is sustainable. Um, I think the final word is about, from, from one of the things that Tunde said, is about recognizing where we are. So, you know, like everybody else, I want to thank Graham and to applaud him for coming here tonight. Um, white male. <laughs> this is up to point to point on it. To coming along to a community and saying, look, We've got a problem, and we need your help to sort it out. We know it's wrong. We don't, we don't like what we're seeing. You know, we've got, at Manchester University, I don't know how many are aware, that, we, that the, at the university, Arthur Lewis was the first black professor to be appointed in the country here at Manchester. Okay, there's a building named after him that most of our kids walk past on the way to Trinity High School, and probably, I don't know if they stopped to read it, and I don't know if many of you would know that. So I want us to see, I want to see that in the next... 10 years that there are more black professors and in the next 20 years that those you know that we've got a proliferation of black professors so people are not walking into my office and talking about me being the only black female academic that they know that's ridiculous and we want the professors and we want them to be coming from our community we want more people from here you know um so when somebody was talking earlier and i was saying about the work that i'm doing i appointed a research assistant to do some work on one of my grants and you know i had 111 applicants and the work is about African Caribbean mental health. It says very clearly in the advert about being a member of the, having knowledge and experience in the community. I had phone calls from Australia, had applications from Hong Kong, I had from the Middle East and from all over but there weren't any Caribbean. So I've got a fantastic and very able but very white woman working with me to do research into black mental health. That's why we need to do something that changes it. That's why we need to change it. Because some of the solutions to our problems, we need to have, we need to have the rigor behind it and we can't have it unless we get the people coming through the pipeline and staying the system, going through, getting PhDs and beyond getting the professorships and so on and being there to effect change. And I think this is the start of that process and I'm delighted to be part of it. So thank you and good night. Thank you.